then the blame rests on God and not you. Because if he has to power, empower you and change your desires and overcome some unwillingness within you, other than the unwillingness you have because you've, you've sold yourself into sin and you don't want to stop. It's like I've heard so many drunks say, oh, I can't stop. I can't stop doing this. Well, no, you don't want to stop. You don't want to put forth the effort. And it's going to take and require a great deal of effort. And God's hand is outstretched, as we show in Isaiah uh, look at chapter 8, at least four or five times he says, but my hand is still outstretched, he says to the wicked people. I say to the same thing, to the gutter, the people in the gutters and in the, in the shame and ruin of their sin. His hand is still outstretched. You've got to take it. You've got to make that effort first. He's not going to change your will for you or override your will or coerce you in some manner other than convicting you with the Holy Spirit. And it's up to you to respond. So if he's got to actually fill you with the Holy Spirit and give you a new mind and a new heart instead of make yourself a new mind and a new heart, like Ezekiel says in chapter 18, well then it's God's fault when you don't stop your lying and fornicating and cheating and drinking and smoking and foul mouth and all the rest of it. It's not your fault. So how can he then hold you accountable for any of those sins unless the responsibility for that sin is placed solely on your head, where it belongs, on your unhindered free choice to choose between right and wrong. Not so you can save yourself. Nobody can save themselves. The blood has to be applied to your past sins. You could return to obedience and live a complete moral and perfect life like some of the past philosophers did in the Greek literature that talks about they quit doing all that wretched stuff, but they didn't have their past sins under the blood of Christ, so they were still under the condemnation. No, we do this so we can come clean with God and walk upright in, in the light and serve Him with reverence and godly fear. That's why. And that we're able to do so. Not we're saving ourselves, trying to self-justify, or pump ourselves up with pride in some manner, like everybody, again, on this side of the, on this side of the church, they're always a self-righteous, and you're self-righteous, and, and you're trying to earn your salvation by works, and be gone with all that stuff. How many times do we have to go over that? A million more times? And I know I exaggerate with a million, but how many more times we got to go over the difference between the works of faith and the works of the law, and why the works of the law cannot justify your past sins? How many more times? before you grasp the fact that there has to be a dynamic of a working and an obedient faith. And faith and obedience are synonymous because you have a choice to seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. And then the Lord will have mercy upon him and our God he will abundantly pardon. The mercy comes after you turned from your wickedness. I mean, that should solve all of it in Isaiah 55, 6, and 7, and hundreds of other verses the same way. But you still don't seem to get it. He says, well, no, he's born dead in his sin. He can't turn. God's got to do something miraculous. Well, if God's got to do something miraculous, then every time you get tempted, he should send an angel down to stop you dead in your tracks before you go and fall into sin. Because this, every, everybody's going to fall like we talked about in one of our previous messages just recently. Everybody's going to fall. Everybody, what a defeatist attitude to have when you have the victory over the sin, the flesh, and the devil. You have faith working by love, purified in your heart through obedience to the truth, and, but everybody's going to fall. No, and everybody's not going to fall if you've changed your willingness from rebellion to obedience. Just like your willingness to love your spouse for the rest of your life and have a pure relationship. You made a willing choice to do that. It's the same with God. So how, how is it fair then that God told man to rule over it? Like Genesis 4-7, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, Cain, but you should rule over it. See, if you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not well, then sin lies at the door and you're going to be ensnared by it when you choose to do it. 
See, if any effort that man makes to stop sinning is impossible without divine intervention, other than the conviction, his outstretched hand that we've always mentioned, then God cannot justly forgive you in your sins and then be considered fair and just, holding you accountable for those sins in the future. It's not fair. It's got to be one way or the other, folks. It can't be a little of both. It's like it can't be a little of penal and a little of moral government and a little of ransom. No, it can't be both ways. You've got to make a clean break with those church doctrines. See, the only way it makes sense is under the lie of moral depravity and human inability. That's why that stuff was invented to begin with, to make it sound feasible that sin isn't the issue just on belief. Just receive and repeat after me, and that's what they've been doing for centuries, leaving people in bondage to their sin. So why do we have to continue then to split hairs over repentance proven by deeds by disputing with one another exactly when and how the sin stops. We all agree that it's got to stop. But we just can't seem to get our finger in our unity together to all speak the same thing, as Paul said in Corinthians, all speak the same thing that about when it stops. And by all logic, I appeal to you again in all truth that unless it stops in this season of godly sorrow with an undetermined time frame in which a self-cleansing humility takes place, emptying the heart of all guile and deceit, coming clean with God, then it's never going to stop afterwards because the heart was never purified in obedience to the truth initially by faith. Okay, Acts 15.9. Peter testified to the Jerusalem Council about the Gentiles. He purified their hearts by faith. How'd that happen? Through this repentance. Like 2 Corinthians 7, 10, and 11 says. In all these things, you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. Clear is the word pure. We've said a hundred times before. Pure through obedience to the truth. So if you pronounce a person saved before this kind of sincere departure from sin has taken place, and it's more than obvious to you, we can't read a person's heart, but we can judge it by their fruits, and the spiritual man judges all things, but the Word of God, then you nullify redemption in that person's life, and you leave them in bondage to that wretchedness, looking for more excuses, and where they're going to find in the missions and the churches, you can't send them back to the churches, that's for sure, and they believe and they're going to be they're saved in their sins. So rather than searching the scriptures for another incident in the scripture there where Jesus encountered this woman or that woman at the well or the woman taken in adultery or the thief on the cross and it looks like they got saved in their sins, there was no penance. Why don't you search the scriptures for a uniform understanding of repentance proven by deeds under the premise that we're arguing for, unhindered free will and ability? for you to come clean with God, in that way, him being fair. Then your message of repentance is going to be effectual in bringing people out of their sins. So based on responsibility and accountability and free will choice that man has, that's the way repentance proven by deeds makes sense. Because otherwise, man's not accountable or responsible for his sins. If he's born defective in any manner, other than he's given himself over to his passions and desires and sold himself into sin, then God's not fair in asking him to come clean. And we go back into this mess where you're saved in your sins, you got the magic cover, and you have no further accountability, even though you sin woefully all the time. Those people that are caught under that mess unless they have an honest, honest heart before God, are never going to come out of it, as we've said before. They've got to start with an honest and sincere heart and a desire to come out of this mess, or they're going to constantly search the Scriptures and find something in favor of sin and then post that on the blogs and say, Here, Mike, here we go. We're saved in our sins. Well, if they want to believe that, there's nothing we can do to un make them unbelieve that. If they won't dig deep, if they won't search, if they won't diligently seek God with a true and honest heart, then they're never going to come to a correct and precise knowledge of the truth. 
that you must come to, like it says there in 1 Timothy 2.5. They come to a knowledge of the truth. God is not willing any pair. They come to a knowledge of the truth, meaning a precise and correct knowledge of the truth, where they realize that they're 100% accountable to God. That's why if anyone sins willfully against their knowledge of the truth, there no sacrifice remains. The fearful expectation of fire and ignition and judgment that will devour the adversary. That's why they've insulted the spirit of grace. They've trampled the sun underfoot. That's the reason no sacrifice remains. And it may indeed be impossible to return them again to repentance. But that didn't happen unless a person was truly enlightened and come, come into the light of God. So that's what I'm appealing for here, that you can't be justified in your sins unless you're preaching some kind of inability. If we're preaching repentance and faith proven by deeds, then we have to be under the premise and the understanding that we go out there and the person and every person is responsible and accountable before God to come clean. That's what I appeal for here. Contact me with any of the questions or concerns you have about these things and I'll be glad to discuss it with you.